welcome friends to today's session of live lectures today for this session we have with us in our studio dr varunendra rawat dr rawat is assistant professor in hindu college in delhi university the today's topic of discussion is micro mitochondrial functions friends let's welcome dr rawat and let's go uh, get into the uh, topic we welcome you dr rawat and let's start with today's topic so today i'm uh, going to talk about a very important organelle namely mitochondria and it is important because it is the uh, powerhouse of the cell that is uh, it is the location where atp or the energy currency of the cell is produced so what makes it so important or what makes it so distinct from other organelles that it is able to synthesize the energy currency of the cell atp and why uh, what features what are the uh, specific features which help this organelle to synthesize atp so today i'll be discussing uh, about the function of mitochondria and how it is able to carry on carry about its functioning of uh, atp synthesis so the objective for this particular lecture uh, would be I, i'll be discussing about redox potentials and i'll be talking about the uh, various electron carriers the constituents of various electron carriers which are responsible for uh, for generating uh, generating the ionic gradient which leads to synthesis of atp in mitochondria so after this lecture we should uh, we should be able to uh, uh, tell about the oxidation reduction potential and composition of the different electron carriers in mitochondria so talking about mitochondria how does it function and what exactly is the function of mitochondria mitochondria is the organism uh, sorry organelle which is able to extract energy from the nutrients from the organic mat materials and uh, store it temporarily in the form of electrical energy and this electrical energy is later on utilized to synthesize atp but it is not directly uh, converted to uh, converted to atp how how this happens the energy which is extracted from the substrate is utilized to create an ionic gradient across the uh, across the in, uh, inner mitochondrial membrane as we know that the mitochondria is made up of two membranes one is the outer mitochondrial membrane and another is inner mitochondrial membrane and uh, these two membranes are separated by intermembrane space so uh, there is there are specific electron carriers which lead to formation of ionic gradient across the across the uh, inner membrane of the mitochondria and uh, this in turn leads to synthesis of atp this ionic gradient which which uh, which exist in the mitochondria because of the electron uh, carriers is uh, utilized to perform work and work in this case is basically to drive synthesis of atp uh, uh, which requires certain other proteins present in the inner mitochondria which uh, i'll be talking about later on so for the mitochondria to perform its function of synthesizing atp there are certain requirements and the requirements are that a gradient has to be created a gradient has to be created between the matrix and the uh, intermembrane space and this gradient should be maintained that means there should be a membrane which is able to uh, able to uh, keep this gradient intact so that this gradient is not broken and there has to be a machinery which is able to utilize this gradient so the basic requirements are a gradient is created which is uh, which is courtesy of the ele uh, various electron carriers Uh, the electron transport system and uh, the gradient has to be maintained which is because of the presence of in inner mitochondrial membrane and then there is the machinery which is the f0 f1 atpase which utilizes this gradient in synthesizing atp in the mitochondria so this particular process that is synthesis of atp by utilizing the ionic gradient is termed as oxidative phosphorylation and this is the main uh, main mechanism by which atp is synthesized in uh, in the cells of any organism there is also substrate level phosphorylation uh, phosphorylation which occurs in cytoplasm during glycolysis uh, cycle uh, wherein atp molecules are formed uh, from adp by directly by transfer of phosphate group from different substrate but in oxidative phosphorylation adp is converted to atp only uh, only in, uh, in the mitochondria so atp formation basically is driven in mitochondria by the energy released from the electrons which were earlier removed during oxidation of various substrate so atp formation is linked to uh, linked to electrons which were removed from various substrates which were oxidized in the mitochondria 
Now, this process of oxidative phosphorylation is uh, basically account for production of a uh, humongous amount or a large amount of ATP. Uh, so much so that in the human body daily uh, production of ATP molecules is about 2 into 10 to power 26. So, that is a very large amount about 2 into 10 to power 26 molecules of ATP are produced uh, are produced in the mitochondria of the uh, of the human body. So, that is a very big amount. So, before moving on to the uh, describing the various electron carriers, we should understand what exactly is redox potential that is oxidation reduction potential. For understanding this, we should know that uh, there are certain agents which are called oxidizing agents or oxidizing substances or reducing substances. So, what is the difference between oxidizing agents and reducing agents? Oxidizing agents are those uh, substances which have a greater affinity for electrons. That means, they can take electrons with, uh, with a greater affinity. So, that is why they are able to oxidize other substances. Greater the affinity for the oxygen, stronger will be the oxidizing uh, potential of the uh, substance and it will, it will be a strong oxidizing agent. Therefore, oxidizing agents have uh, been ranked according to their affinity for electrons. Greater the affinity, greater is the, uh, greater is the oxidizing uh, capability of that particular substance. Whereas, reducing agents have low affinity for electrons and they can also be ranked according to their affinity for electrons. And these are the substances which lose electron very easily. So, that is why they are able to transfer their electrons to uh, some of the substances and in process they reduce them. That is why they are termed as reducing agents. So, these uh, reducing agents can also be ranked according to their electron transfer potential. Substances which are having a high electron transfer potential are termed as strong reducing agent and NADH is uh, a very good example of uh, uh, this particular category. Whereas, substances which have low electron transfer potential, they are termed as weak reducing agent like water. Water is having a uh, very less ability to uh, lose electrons. So, it is a weak reducing agent. And a uh, peculiar thing about uh, oxidizing and reducing agent is that they always occur in pair. For example, NADH and NAD are a couple. NAD plus is, uh, is an oxidizing agent and uh, NADH is reducing agent and the basic difference between them is difference in the number of electrons. So, there always exists a couple of oxidizing and reducing agents. It always happens that strong reducing agents are coupled to weak oxidizing agent and strong oxidizing agents are coupled to uh, weak reducing agent. For uh, in this particular example of NAD plus and NADH, NADH is a strong reducing agent and it is coupled to a weak oxidizing agent that is NAD plus. So, there is always a couple and one of them uh, is a strong, uh, strong, uh, stronger, uh, stronger uh, individual like strong oxidizing agent will always be coupled with weaker reducing agent. So, this redox potential of different uh, pairs, different couples is measured in relation to a standard and standard in this particular case is taken as H plus and H2, H plus ions and H2 gas. And uh, for each of the pair, for each of the couple, it is always in relation to this particular standard couple of H plus and H2. Though, what is exactly the standard uh, redox potential? Standard re redox potential also termed as E naught is the voltage produced by half cell a half cell in which member of uh, the couple is present at a st standard concentration under standard condition. So, half cell contains uh, both the members of the couple at standard, con uh, standard concentration and standard condition. For example, standard condition uh, for solutes and ions is 1 molar and for gases it is 1 atmospheric pressure and the standard condition is 25 degrees uh, centigrade. Uh, the redox potential for uh, H plus and H2 couple is 0 is taken as 0 and this occurs at, uh, at, uh, uh, at 1 molar concentration of uh, hydrogen and which is basically equal to pH 0. However, that is not suitable for biological conditioning and uh, we take, uh, we take uh, pH 7 for estimating the uh, redox potential of H plus and H2 and at that particular pH wherein the H plus ion concentration is 10 to power minus 7, the uh, redox potential of H plus and H2 is minus 0.42 volt and all, this, all the other couples are uh, measured in relation to this particular potential and uh, uh, that is termed as E naught 0 that is the uh, 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 electron potential. Uh, standard electron uh, potential at, uh, at pH 7. So, this particular panel shows 
two half cells. One half cells contain the standard of H plus ions and uh, hydrogen gas in under standard uh, concentration and the other half cell has the other couple of uh, oxidizing agent and reducing agent and they are joined together by a voltmeter and KCL bridge which uh, ensure that the uh, which ensure that there is no electronic uh, electrochemical gradient occurring between the two half cells. So, this is how we measure if, if the if there is transfer of electron from the uh, sample half cell to the uh, standard half cell then it, it is termed that the, uh, the uh, redox potential of uh, this particular uh, couple will be higher than the hydrogen. But if there is transfer of electron from the hydrogen uh, half cell to the, uh, to the sample half cell then, uh, then the uh, redox potential of this particular couple will be lesser than the hydrogen. So, accordingly uh, redox potential of a large number of substances have been measured at pH 7 and this particular panel shows how, uh, how, they are, uh, how they are placed in relation to hydrogen. We can easily see that NAD, NADH has quite high potential uh, as compared to uh, we, uh, say succinate and fumarate group. So, the positioning of different substances in this particular table and the uh, the negative or positive sign tells us about uh, tells us about their uh, ability to transfer electron and their relation their positioning in, in respect to the uh, standard hydrogen uh, couple tells us whether these substances will be able to donate electrons or whether these cells will be the ones which will be uh, which will be taking electrons from other substances so nadh has a higher uh, higher high redox uh, potential that is it has capability of transferring electrons whereas um, acetate and acetaldehyde couple has much higher uh, redox potential as compared to both uh, hydrogen as well as NADH. Whereas oxaloacetate and malate group ha has a very uh, less uh, redox potential as compared to hydrogen and these are the ones which will be taking up electrons. So, whenever there is uh, oxidation reduction reaction that means whenever there is transfer of electrons from one uh, substance to another substance there is, uh, it is, uh, there is a loss in free energy that is every such oxidation reduction reaction is accompanied by loss in free energy. This standard free energy change that is the loss in free energy can be ca calculated from the standard redox potential at pH 7 of the two couples which are involved in any reaction. So, whenever a chemical reaction occurs between two couples wherein transfer of electrons occurs from one to another, we can always calculate the standard free energy change which occurs in that particular chemical reaction. And this can be calculated by this particular formula delta G naught that is the change in the free energy is equal to minus N F into delta E, 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 uh, e prime naught. N is the number of electrons which are transferred in this particular reaction from one substance one of the couple to another uh, couple. F is the Faraday's constant and delta E prime naught is the, is the difference in the redox potential of the two couples. Greater the delta E naught that is greater is the difference in the redox potential of the two couples which are partaking in the chemical reaction. Farther will be the reaction proceeding towards the product, towards the formation of products till the equilibrium is reached. So, greater the uh, difference in redox potential, greater will be the products, uh, amount of product form till the equilibrium is reached between the substrate and the product. So, we consider this particular example uh, wherein NADH is getting oxidized to form a water molecule and NAD plus. So, herein as we can see uh, there, are, uh, there are two uh, couples uh, interacting here oxygen and water and we have NADH, NAD plus and NADH. So, if we consider the first reaction we see that half of the molecular oxygen plus 2 H uh, plus ions that is 2 hydrogen ions and 2 electrons will give uh, rise to or they will form one water molecule. The redox potential for this particular reaction is as we can see it is 0.82 volt. Whereas, NAD plus can be reduced uh, to form NADH and H plus uh, if, if, if there are two hydrogen ions present and two electrons are present and uh, this particular reaction has redox potential of minus 0.32 volt. So, the difference in the redox potential of these two couples comes to be 0.82 volt minus, minus 0.32 volt which is about 1.14 volt. So, delta E prime naught that is the difference in redox potential of the two couples is 1.14 volt. When we put this value in the equation delta G prime is, uh, is equal to minus N F into delta E prime naught, we get the value minus 2 into 23.063 kilocalorie uh, per volt mole 
which is the Faraday's constant. And if we multiply that with 1.14 volt, we get a value of minus 52.6 kilocalorie per mole of NADH oxidized. So, the change in free energy per mole of NADH oxidized is quite high, which is 0.52.6 kilocalorie per mole. If this value is, uh, is utilized in formation of ATP, then a large number of ATP molecules can be formed. Of course, the uh, G value, actual G value depends on the concentration of products and reactants. So, this uh, minus 52.6 is the standard value, but depending on the concentration of uh, reactants and products, it might uh, increase or decrease. So, this particular amount of value, uh, this particular amount of energy which is released when NAD plus uh, is like uh, reduced into NADH, uh, sorry, NADH is reduced into, uh, NADH is converted into NAD plus and water. This energy can be utilized to drive formation of a large number of ATP molecules. For formation of one ATP molecule, we require about 7.3 kilocalorie per mole of energy. So, minus 52.6 kilocalorie per mole will uh, form about 8 or uh, 7 uh, ATP molecules. However, this transfer of energy does not take place in a single step in the mitochondria. This transfer of energy takes place in a number of small steps. Each step leads to release of a small amount of energy. And in uh, cumulative, uh, cumulative effect of this release of energy will uh, ultimately lead to formation of ATP molecules later on. So, uh, in, in the cell, electrons are transferred uh, to NAD plus or FAD from the, uh, from the uh, substrate of the glycolytic cycle as well as substrates of the TCA cycle. As we can uh, see here, glycolysis is basically a series of steps which uh, is catalyzed by a number of enzymes. And herein we can see in the step uh, number 6, uh, glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate dehydrogenase uh, leads to formation of 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate. And in this process, NAD plus is reduced to NADH. Herein we see that 2 NAD plus are getting reduced to 2 NADH because uh, whenever glucose uh, breaks, uh, it breaks into, uh, through the steps of glycolysis, it breaks into dihydroxyacetone phosphate and glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. Dihydroxyacetone phosphate is later on converted to glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate because it is a substrate for the enzyme of the glycolytic cycle. So, herein uh, NAD plus is getting reduced to NADH. The end product of glycolytic cycle as we can see is pyruvate, but this pyruvate has to be converted to a, 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 a product which can be utilized by the uh, enzymes of the TCA cycle. And when this conversion occurs, therein again occurs formation of NADH from NAD plus molecule. So, two pyruvate molecules will be converted into two acetyl coenzyme A molecules and in process two NAD plus will be uh, converted to two NADH molecules. So, uh, these NADH molecules will later on be utilized by the electron transport chain of the mitochondria and uh, later on ATP will be formed. So, the NADH which is formed in the uh, cytosol, it cannot be directly transferred inside the, uh, inside the matrix of the mitochondria. It requires a presence of certain other substrates and enzyme. It enters the mitochondria either by malate aspartate shuttle or it, uh, it is transferred to, FA, uh, the electrons are transferred to FAD by the glycerol phosphate shuttle which leads to production of FADH2. So, there are two shuttles namely malate aspartate shuttle which reduces NAD plus to NADH and uh, then there is glycerol phosphate shuttle which transfers the electrons of NADH to FAD leading to formation of FADH2. So, this particular malate aspartate shuttle shows us that uh, NADH which is present in the cytosol uh, it combines, uh, it basically oxaloacetate combines with NADH leading to formation of malate which can enter the mitochondrial matrix. And in the mitochondrial matrix, there are enzymes dehydrogenases which convert NAD plus back into NADH uh, and malate is converted to oxaloacetate. This oxaloacetate then combines with glutamate leading to formation of alpha ketoglutarate and aspartate. This alpha, alpha ketoglutarate can be transferred back into the intermembrane space and into the cytosol and aspartate can also be transferred back. So, this uh, there occurs a set of reaction which leads to transfer of reducing equivalents of NADH into the matrix of the mitochondria. Whereas, glycerol phosphate shuttle acts slightly differently. It, it leads to uh, conversion of di uh, dihydroacetone phosphate into glycerol 3 phosphate and uh, the reducing equivalents are transferred to to FADH2 molecule. And in citric acid cycle also we know that there is formation of uh, 3 NADH molecules and 1 FADH2 molecule. 
So these reducing equivalents have to be transferred by the electron carriers in the in the uh, mitochondrial matrix. So electron transport chain basically uh, consists of a, a set of uh, complexes, a set of uh, uh, proteins, and these proteins can basically be categorized under uh, flavoproteins or cytochromes, copper atoms, ubiquinone, and iron sulfur protein. And all of these proteins, except ubiquinone, have prosthetic groups uh, which act as redox centers, the centers where uh, oxidation reduction reaction take place. These flavoproteins have, uh, uh, they have either FAD or uh, FMN groups attached to them and these uh, prosthetic groups are basically derived from riboflavin, and each is uh, capable of accepting two protons and two electrons. So this panel shows uh, FMN how it is reduced to uh, FMNS2. Cytochromes also uh, consist of heme prosthetic groups and they have F, uh, iron in Fe2 plus or Fe3 plus oxidation state and uh, they uh, are capable of accepting and losing a single electron. And there are three cytochromes, cytochromes A, B and C present in the electron transport chain. This particular panel shows uh, the presence of uh, the heme group in the uh, cytochromes. And of course, there are copper atoms, three copper atoms are located in a single protein complex of the inner mitochondrial membrane and each of them are capable of uh, accepting and donating a single electron and they alternate between Cu2 plus state and Cu plus oxidation state. Then we have ubiquinone or coenzyme Q which is basically a lipid sol soluble molecule and it is uh, having a long hydrophobic chain which is composed of five carbon isoprenoid units. And this particular molecule is able to uh, move within the membrane and it is able to accept uh, and donate two electrons and protons. The partially reduced form of uh, ubiquinone is termed as ubisemiquinone and fully reduced molecule is termed as ubiquinone. So this, uh, this particular panel shows the uh, ubiquinone, uh, ubiquinone unit uh, and the semi, uh, ubisemiquinone that is the partially reduced state and completely reduced uh, state that is ubiquinone which has two uh, hydrogen uh, atoms attached to it. Then we have iron sulfur proteins which uh, have iron atoms present in the protein. They are linked to inorganic sulfur atoms and uh, as a part of iron sulfur atom. The most common centers of iron sulfur proteins contain two or four atoms of iron and sulfur and they are linked to protein at the cysteine residues. The cysteine is an amino acid which has sul a sulfur group, sulfhydryl group. And uh, each single center of iron sulfur protein, whether there are four, uh, four iron or two iron, they are capable of accepting and donating only a single electron. The redox potential of these centers depends on the uh, surrounding area, that is the uh, hydrophobicity and charge of the surrounding amino acids. So this particular panel shows uh, the iron sulfur proteins, which uh, can be present in the, uh, in the uh, mitochondrial membrane. All the, uh, uh, all the carriers of the transport chain are uh, arranged in an increasingly positively, uh, positive redox potential so that electrons can be transferred easily from, uh, the, from the group, uh, from the uh, carrier which is having a uh, higher redox potential to the one which is having a lower redox potential. So each carrier is reduced by gain of electrons from the preceding carrier and it reduces the sub, uh, subsequent carrier in the electron transport chain. This particular panel shows the movement of uh, electrons from FMN to uh, cyt uh, ubiquinone, uh, then cytochrome B, cytochrome C1, cytochrome C and cy uh, cytochrome A3. And then uh, the last receiver is oxygen which gets converted to water. And there are three steps marked by red arrows wherein there is a, there is a sufficient decrease in the energy or release of energy as electrons are uh, transferred from uh, one carrier to another carrier. So these, uh, this tells us about the different uh, carriers which are present in the inner mitochondrial membrane and the components of the electron transport chain responsible for release of energy as the electrons are transferred from one carrier to another carrier. Thank you. Thank you friends for jo uh, joining us in uh, this half of the lecture. We will meet you again after a break and we will continue with mitochondrial functions after this break.
welcome back friends and uh, for this half of the lecture we will be discussing ATP formation in mitochondrial functions. Let us move on to Dr. Varunendra Rawat and continue with this uh, topic. We uh, again welcome you sir and let us move on to the ATP formation of mitochondrial functions. So friends, uh, in this particular uh, lecture, I will be talking about uh, ATP formation in mitochondria. As is already known that a, uh, mitochondria is the site or the organelle within the cell which leads to formation of ATP which is the currency of the cell. So how exactly this particular process occur and why it occurs only in mitochondria and not, not some other organelle like endoplasmic reticulum or uh, some other uh, organelle like nucleus or lysosome. This is because of the peculiar structure of the mitochondria which enables it to uh, enables it to form ATP uh, ATP in large amount and it has a peculiar structure because uh, mitochondria is uh, a double membrane structure it has an outer membrane and it has inner membrane inner membrane encloses the matrix which uh, which houses a set of enzymes enzymes which are responsible for TCA cycle and then the inner mitochondrial membrane has a set of uh, complexes uh, complexes of protein which are responsible for transferring electrons uh, which are gained by reducing different substrate uh, namely in this case glucose the product of uh, glucose uh, products of glycolysis and uh, these substrates are oxidized and the electrons which are derived from these substrates are then they are passed from one carrier to another and this leads to uh, release of energy. This energy is basically uh, accumulated in a form of ionic gradient across the intermembrane across the uh, across the inner uh, mitochondrial membrane and this ionic gradient is the one which is uh, which will lead to formation of ATP in the subsequent course. So what exactly are the steps I will be talking about them and what are the uh, different complexes involved and uh, how they function to uh, generate ATP inside the mitochondria. So basically I will be talking about uh, electron transport chain the various complexes involved in the electron transport chain how they function and a very important component which uh, of this particular uh, of this particular process is proton motive force what exactly is proton motive force how it is responsible for ATP generation and the third most important component that is the ATP synthase once the gradient ionic gradient has been generated once it is sustained because of presence of uh, inner mitochondrial membrane between the matrix and the intermembrane space how do we convert this ionic gradient into energy currency that is ATP. So we require some machinery for converting this gradient into uh, the energy currency that is ATP and ATP synthesis is that particular machinery. So after this particular lecture we should be able to uh, uh, tell about the working of the electron transport chain what is the proton motive force and how does ATP synthesis function how is it able to utilize the ionic gradient into production of ATP that is adenosine, uh, adenosine triphosphate. So uh, there are basically four different electron transport complexes occurring in the inner mitochondrial membrane and these transport uh, these electron transport complexes as they are uh, they are termed complexes because there are number of proteins involved in, uh, in, in involved in uh, the uh, transfer of electrons. However, Two, uh, two such molecules cytochrome C and ubiquinone which take part in ele electron transport they are not a part of any of these complexes. These complexes are more or less fixed and stable in the mitochondrial membrane but cytochrome C and ubiquinone are the one which can move from one complex to another complex in a process carrying the electrons from one complex to another complex. So they are not basically they are not static and they are not part of any of the four complexes. So what are these four complexes I will be talking about later on ubiquinone is basically a molecule uh, which exists in the lipid bilayer and cytochrome C is a protein which is a soluble protein present in the intermembrane space which is capable of movement along the along the uh, inner mitochondrial membrane. So these ubiquinone and cytochrome C are the moieties or, or the, are the molecules which shuttle electrons between the large protein complexes of the electron transport chain. Whenever uh, NADH is the electron donor as we know that NADH is generated in, uh, in the uh, glycolysis uh, glycolytic cycle and transferred inside the uh, mitochondrial matrix through a malate aspartate shuttle or glycerol phosphate shuttle or NADH which is generated in the TCA cycle whenever this NADH is the electron donor then the electrons enter the respiratory chain by means of the complex 1. 
which then transfer the electron to ubiquinone generating ubiquinol in process okay but whenever FADH2 is formed like in glycerol phosphate shuttle we know FADH2 is formed and one molecule of FADH2 is also formed during the event of the TCA cycle when FADH2 is formed it does not transfer its electron to the complex one instead it remains bound to the succinate dehydrogenase which is the enzyme uh, responsible for carrying out reaction which a uh, byproduct of which is FADH2 and uh, succinate dehydrogenase is the only uh, enzyme of the TCA cycle which is present in the in, uh, inner mitochondrial membrane which is not present in the soluble uh, matrix. So, succinate dehydrogenase is the component of the complex 2 of the electron transport chain. Whenever FADH2 is the donor it bypasses the complex 1 it donates the electron directly to ubiquinone leading to formation of ubiquinol. So, one step is bypassed whenever FADH2 is the electron donor this we have to uh, remember. So, uh, electron transport chain basically has three specific position or three specific places wherein a transfer of electrons is accompanied by a release of a great amount of energy major release of energy. What are these sites? These coupling sites occurs between carriers which are part of three complexes complex 1, complex 3 and complex 4. There is no release of energy whenever electrons are transferred in the uh, in the complex 2 which, uh, which we know that succinate dehydrogenase is a part of which lead to formation of FADH2. As the electrons pass from one carrier to another carrier of the electron transport chain free energy is released and this particular energy is utilized and it is conserved by translocating protons from the matrix into the intermembrane space through the inner mitochondrial membrane. So, in the complex 1, complex 3 and complex 4 whenever electrons are transferred the energy is released this energy leads to transfer of protons from the mitochondrial matrix through the inner mitochondrial membrane into the intermembrane space. And this will lead to accumulation of hydrogen ions in the intermembrane space which will create a gradient of H plus ions. Later this gradient that is the concentration gradient of H plus ions will be utilized to produce ATP molecules inside the mitochondria. These complexes namely complexes 1, 3 and 4 are also termed as proton pumps and they help in establishment of proton gradient because if there is no proton gradient ATP synthesis will stop. This particular panel shows us the uh, existence of the four complexes namely complex 1 which is in orange in color, complex 3 which is sky blue and complex uh, 2 which is faded blue and complex 4 which is pink in color. So, complex 1 uh, we see has FMN, uh, FMN prosthetic group, complex 3 has uh, cytochromes and FES groups and complex 2 has FES groups whereas complex 4 has cytochrome uh, groups as well as copper ion. So, we see here that NADH is oxidized to NAD plus in the complex 1. Whenever two electrons are transferred through this particular complex, four H plus ions are pumped into the intermembrane space. Similarly, uh, uh, similarly in the complex 3, we can see that four H plus ions are pumped into the, into the intermembrane space whenever electrons are transferred from complex 1 to ubiquinol and from ubiquinol to complex 3. So, we see that two electrons are transferred from complex 1 to UQ which is ubiquinol uh, and then ubiquinol transfers two electrons to complex 3. When this happens then 4 H plus are again pumped into the intermembrane space. Then from the complex 3 cytochrome C takes up the electrons and transfers them to complex 4 and when this happens two hydrogen ions or two H plus ions are transferred from the from the uh, from the matrix into the intermembrane space and the end product of this particular uh, transfer is oxygen is uh, basically reduced to water. Uh, half molecule of oxygen is reduced to one molecule of water with uh, with a concerted, uh, concerted uh, transfer of two hydrogen ions from the matrix into the uh, intermembrane space. We see here that uh, in the complex 2 FAD FADH2 uh, it, it basically transfers electrons to ubiquinol which then transfers its electrons to complex 3 and from complex 3 uh, cytochrome C takes these electrons to complex 4. So, we clearly see that 
Whenever FADH2 is the electron donor, the, com the complex 1 step is uh, bypassed and from complex 2 directly electrons are transferred to complex 3, from there to cytochrome C and from cytochrome C to complex 4. From complex 2 to complex 3 again the transfer of electrons occur through ubiquinol. Uh, the ubiquinone basically takes up two, uh, 2 electrons and uh, it transferred, it gets converted to ubiquinol and takes these electrons to complex 3. So, these complexes are basically made up of a large number of proteins as we can see here they are made up of a number of subunit. The complex 1 which is basically NADH dehydrogenase in mammalian NADH dehydrogenase complex is basically made up of uh, 7 subunits which are encoded by mitochondrial DNA and 38 by nuclear DNA. Complex 3 which is basically cytochrome B C1 complex, 1 subunit is encoded by mitochondrial DNA and 10 by nuclear DNA. Succinate dehydrogenase does not have uh, or complex 2 does not have any, any subunit which is encoded by mitochondrial DNA. All these subunits, there are 4 subunits, they are encoded by nuclear DNA. And complex 4 which is also cytochrome C oxidase, the last complex, uh, it has 3 subunits and encoded by mitochondrial DNA and 10 by nuclear DNA. Cytochrome C oxidase were basically isolated and it was seen that whenever it, uh, it, it, uh, it, it is inserted into a liposome, we could see that it is able to pump hydrogen ions from inside the liposome into the surrounding medium leading to change in the or uh, change in the pH of the medium or making it acidic. So, this was the first uh, indication that there is uh, associated with these complexes uh, a pumping function of hydrogen uh, ions H plus ions from inside the matrix towards the intermembrane space. So, the first complex or uh, if we talk about it in detail is NADH dehydrogenase complex. It catalyzes transfers of a pair of electron from NADH to uh, ubiquinone leading to formation of OB, uh, UQH2 or ubiquinone. This complex has 45 subunits as already uh, told and it has a very uh, high molecular mass of about a million Dalton. And already I have uh, said that there are 7 subunits which are encoded by mitochondrial genes and these are homologous to bacterial uh, similar ba um, bacterial polypeptides to complexes which are present in the bacterial membrane. The complex 1 has FMN containing flavoprotein which oxidizes NADH. It has 7 RN sulfur uh, centers and 2 molecules of ubiquinone which are bound to it. Passage of a pair of electrons through this complex 1 is accompanied by movement of 4 protons from matrix to the intermembrane space. Complex 2 is succinate dehydrogenase. There are 2 hydrophobic units which anchor the protein in the membrane and 2 hydrophilic units which basically comprise the enzyme known as succinate dehydrogenase. There are 4 subunits total. Complex 2 transfers electrons from succinate to FAD and from FAD it transfers the electrons to uh, sub ubiquinone. And in this particular complex 3 FES that is iron sulfur centers are involved for transferring of electrons. Electron transfer through complex 2 is not accompanied by proton transfer. Though electron transfer occurs here, but there is no uh, simultaneous transfer of H plus ions from the inter, uh, from the matrix to the intermembrane space. Complex 3 which is also known as cytochrome B C1 because of presence of cytochrome B and cytochrome C1, it catalyzes the transfer of electrons from ubiquinol to cytochrome C as already discussed. Whenever transfer of electrons occurs in this particular complex, 4 protons are pumped from the matrix to the intermembrane space across the inter, uh, inner mitochondrial membrane for every pair of electrons which pass through this complex. So, 2 protons which are pumped out are derived from ubiquinol directly which comes from either uh, which comes from uh, the, uh, the uh, complex 1 or from complex 2 and 2 additional proteins are removed from the matrix, uh, not protein sorry, 2 additional protons are removed from the matrix and translocated as a part of second uh, molecule of ubiquinol. So, in total 4 H plus ions are pumped out. So, there are 3 subunits which contain redox groups in uh, this particular complex, cytochrome B which is encoded by mitochondrial gene, it contains 2 heme B molecules and there is cytochrome C1 and an iron sulfur protein. So, there are uh, 3 redox groups. Then we have uh, complex 4 which is cytochrome oxidase, the last complex of the electron transport chain and uh, this particular complex leads to transfer of electrons from, uh, from the uh, cytochrome uh, C to oxygen. This particular complex uh, is 
also termed as cytochrome oxidase because for every molecule of OT reduced, uh, 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 there is formation of uh, there is formation of one uh, two molecules of water uh, water H two O, and eight protons are taken from the matrix. So four protons are used in formation of water molecules. For every molecule of O2 reduced, two water molecules are formed and therefore four protons are utilized in formation of water molecules and four protons are translocated across the membrane whenever electron transfer occurs through complex 3 of the electron transport chain. So the overall reaction is 4 cytochromes C2 plus plus 8H plus, one molecule of O2 give 4 cytochrome oxidation state C3 plus and two water molecules and 4 H plus. These 4 H plus are formed outside. Uh, the respiratory poisons like carbon monoxide, azide and cyanide bind to this uh, the heme A3 site of the cytochrome oxidase though uh, the carbon monoxide is also able to bind heme of the hemoglobin group. So, this particular panel shows how uh, there is uh, there is transfer of 4 H plus from inside the matrix to outside and how 4 H plus are utilized to form two molecules of water. At a time only one electron is transferred uh, between various groups in the uh, cytochrome C oxidase molecule like from cytochrome C to copper ion CuA, from CuA to heme A, from heme A to heme A3 and from heme A3 to CuB. At a given time only one electron is transferred but overall four electron uh, transfer, uh, transfer of four electrons is accompanied by transfer of 4 H plus from inside the matrix to outside and combination of 4 H plus with uh, molecular oxygen to give rise to two molecules of water. This particular enzyme has 13 subunits. Uh, electron transfer occurs one at a time as I have already told from cytochrome C to CuA and from CuA to heme A and from there electrons are passed to uh, heme A3 and from heme A3 to copper uh, B, CuB. So, for every molecule of O2 reduced to 2H2O, 4H plus ions are consumed and 4H plus ions are translocated. So, this translocation, this uh, particular uh, movement of uh, protons across the, uh, across the inner membrane results in greater number of positive charges in the intermembrane space and a greater number of negative charges within the matrix. H plus are moved outside, OH minus remain inside the matrix. So, there exists an electrochemical gradient, H plus is more outside though and uh, the positive ions are more outside and they are less inside. So, it leads to formation of an ionic gradient which is also termed as proton gradient and this results from two components. The first component basically is the concentration difference between hydrogen ions on the two sides of the membrane. The outside or the intermembrane space has a large concentration of H plus ions and the inside has le less concentration. So, there is a concentration difference between, H, uh, between the intermembrane space and the matrix. And secondly, because of this concentration gradient uh, differ uh, difference, there is a presence of a voltage which results from separation of charge across the membrane. The inner membrane is not porous or not permeable to H plus ions. H plus ions cannot move freely from one side to another side. So, there is a difference or, or the separation of charge across the membrane and it leads to uh, voltage creation. So, these are the two components which leads to formation of proton gradient. This proton gradient therefore is termed as electrochemical gradient because there is voltage and there is a chemical uh, difference or concentration difference of the ions. The energy present in both the components of proton electrochemical gradient can be combined together to give rise to a proton motive force which is termed as delta P. And this particular proton motive force can be measured in millivolts by a voltmeter. This particular proton motive force can also be calculated using this particular formula delta P is equal to psi minus 2.3 RT by into RT by F and multiplied with delta pH. Delta pH is the difference in the concentration of hydrogen ion uh, between the matrix and the intermembrane space. At 25 degree cent, uh, centigrade that is the standard con, uh, temperature condition 2.3 RT by F is about 59 millivolts. So, if we put this value here delta P is equal to psi minus 59 into delta pH. So, it tells us that proton motive force is dependent on the permeability properties of the inner membrane. If the inner membrane is highly porous then there will not be any proton motive force because there will be free passing of H plus ions. But the, uh, the membrane is not 
permeable as such and therefore it lead to creation of proton motive force. So actively respires, uh, respiring mitochondria generate a proton motive force of about 220 millivolts which is a very high voltage uh, across the membrane. In mammalian mitochondria, most of the most of the PMF or the proton motive force is created uh, because of the uh, because of the voltage component. 80 percent of the free energy of delta P is basically represented by voltage component, and only 20 percent by the proton concentration difference, which is about 0.5 to 1 pH difference. Uh, the pH difference cannot be very large because other otherwise the enzyme will not be able to function. There are certain substances like 2,4-dinitrophenol which can uncouple glucose oxidation and ADP phosphorylation and they lead to generation of heat. These drugs have been used uh, by dietitian to, uh, to help a patient to reduce weight because they uncouple the uh, production of ATP uh, with, the, uh, with the oxidation and uh, therefore the body of the organism starts using fat. But now uh, this particular substance has been banned. But in nature, uh, there occur in certain types of cells like the brown adipo adipose tissue found in children, there occur proteins which act as uncoupler, which, uh, which leads to oxidation of glucose without production of ATP, but instead they produce heat. And uh, two people can be having different metabolic uh, metabolism because of presence of these uh, uncouplers. They might be eating same amount of uh, food, same amount of glucose. But one might be able to uh, metabolize or uh, metabolize this glucose completely leading to formation of ATP, other might just be producing heat. So uh, this has been the focus of uh, the uh, uh, dietitians or the nutritionists across the world that how these uncouplers can be utilized to reduce weight of obese organisms. Coming to uh, ATP formation, ATP formation is uh, basically uh, drived by, uh, it's driven by an uh, a protein known as ATPase and this particular ATPase was first discovered by Humberto Fernandez and he discovered a, uh, a series of spheres attached, attached to the inner membrane and this discovery was done in about year 90, early 1960. Then later on Ephraim Rocker of Cornell University, he isolated the inner membrane spheres and term these inner membrane spheres as coupling factor F, uh, coupling, coupling factor uh, 1 or a, uh, F1, which is the acronym for this particular sphere. These F1 spheres acted like ATP bases. Now it is, uh, this seem incongruous that uh, the, uh, organ, uh, the organelle which is producing ATP, why it should have an ATP base which basically function to, uh, function to metabolize ATP. So, Basically what happens is that these ATPase can, uh, can, they can uh, form ATP or they can hydrolyze ATP because uh, it is dependent on the concentration of the, uh, subst uh, the substrate and experimental proof occurred thereof. This particular panel shows the occurrence of spheres in the inner membrane space. This, these are F1 particles and uh, it has been shown that if we take sodium potassium ATPase which is present in a number of cells in the body. And the, uh, it basically helps in uh, helps in movement of Na plus and K plus ion in opposite direction by uh, utilizing ATP. If we change the uh, concentration so, such that Na plus is very much high in, uh, outside and K plus is very much high inside, then uh, it, it can happen that Na plus will start moving down the electrochemical gradient and K plus will start moving down the electrochemical gradient from inside to outside. And when this occurs, ATP formation will occur. So the normal function of this ATP is, is movement of sodium ion and K plus ion by consuming ATP but reversing the concentration gradient of the substrate, we can utilize this particular enzyme to produce ATP. So something like this happens in, uh, in the mitochondria wherein the uh, ATP is able to produce ATP. This uh, enzyme is basically termed as ATP synthase and it is a mushroom say, shaped protein which is basically made up of two components spherical F1 head and a basal section called F0. This F0 is basically embedded in the inner membrane and F1 is projecting toward the matrix. These two portions that is F0 and F1 they are connected by a central and a peripheral stalk. And mammalian mitochondria, each mammalian mitochondria has about 15,000 such copies of ATP synthase. And similar type of enzymes have been found in uh, bacterial membranes and thylakoids of chloroplast. Now, F1 portion of bi uh, bacterial and mi mitochondrial ATP, they are highly conserved and they are made up of five polypeptides, namely alpha, beta, uh, delta, gamma and epsilon. There are three copies of alpha and three copies of beta and single copy of delta, epsilon and gamma. 
these alpha and beta uh, subunits are arranged alternatively in F1 head like uh, the uh, like the slices of oranges and each F1 contains three catalytic site for ATP synthesis and these sites are present on each beta subunit. The gamma subunit basically runs from the outer tip of the F1 head through the center stalk and it makes contact with the F0 which is present in the uh, in the uh, in the membrane. Now this F0 portion which is present in the membrane, uh, it, it has about 3 different uh, three different polypeptides A, B and C, B is present in 2 copies and C has about 10 to 14 which varies between bacteria and yeast. Uh, so that is why we have given the number 10 to 14. Now this particular F0 base also has a channel through which protons can be conducted from the intermembrane space into the matrix. So this is the uh, this is the panel. This shows us uh, the uh, the arrangement of different polypeptides of F0. We can see three alpha, three beta, one gamma, which passes through the center. We have uh, delta unit and uh, delta unit, and uh, for F0 we have C units and A subunits and B subunit, which makes contact outside the uh, outside the F0 sub uh, outside the F1 subunit. So the ATP formation basically how does it occur a theory was proposed or hypothesis was proposed by Paul Boyer this is termed as binding change mechanism which says that as the H plus ions move from outside to inside there is change in the binding affinity of the different beta subunits for the ADP and PI and this leads to formation of ATP and this requires passing of H plus from outside to inside. The energy which is released by movement of protons is directly not used to drive uh, phosphorylation of ADP into ATP, but it is used for changing the affinity of beta subunits for uh, ADP and PI or for the product which is ATP. Now each active site, there are three active sites, each of them progresses uh, through three subsequent, uh, three uh, different conformation which have different affinities for the substrate and product. At any given time the three catalytic sites, the three subunit uh, have catalytic site, they are present in three different conformation. One is loose or L conformation in which ADP and PI are loosely bound to the uh, catalytic site. Another is tight conformation in which ADP and PI are tightly bound and ATP can be formed in this particular site. And third is open or O conformation where it is very low affinity for uh, the ATP and it leads to release of ATP from the active site. So this particular ATP uh, is synthesized by rotational catalysis. Uh, there is rotation of a part of ATP synthase with respect to other parts and this leads to formation of ATP. And this particular rotation is driven by movement of proton. As I have already said that apical end of gamma subunit it interacts with different beta subunit and as this gamma subunit rotates it interacts with three beta subunits and it changes the conformation of these three beta subunits leading to uh, they are changing uh, they are changing the conformation from uh, uh, loose to tight to open stages and thus ATP formation can occur. This particular panel shows how uh, how the three subunits are present in three different conformation open L and T, O L and T conformation and uh, how each conformation has a specific affinity. O conformation does not have any affinity for ATP but it can lead to binding of ADP and PI. Loose uh, conformation has bound ADP and PI whereas tight conformation has ADP and PI which are bound to it and ATP formation occurs in this tight conformation. So these. Uh, this panel shows how open conformation binds ADP and PI, after binding it converts to L conformation, L conformation then gets converted to tight conformation by conversion, its conversion to uh, ADP and uh, PI conversion to ATP and when ATP is released it gets converted to uh, O conformation. So how this uh, occurs, this rotatory movement occurs, this has been proved experimentally that uh, the rotatory movement of gamma subunit can drive the uh, rotation of actin filament which is attached to uh, F0, uh, F0, F1 ATP. So the rotation of gamma subunit can also uh, drive the formation of ATP whenever there is transfer of uh, hydrogen ions from the matrix, uh, from the intermembrane space to the matrix. The F0 subunit are the one responsible for this particular movement. The C subunits move whenever there is movement of protons and this leads to movement of gamma subunits and this leads to change in conformation of beta subunits. And once that happens, uh, this leads to transfer of protons and ATP synthesis in the, 
in the mitochondrial membrane. So this particular panel shows there are uh, C subunits which each of which can uh, take hydrogen ions from the intermembrane space and this binds to the asparagine residue of the C subunit and these subunits rotate and then dry, uh, drive off the proton to the half, one half of the, uh, the other half of the A subunit and this movement of the C subunits leads ultimately to production of ATP in the mitochondrial, uh, in the mitochondrial matrix. Thank you. Dr. Rawat and we thank you all and we hope that you get a great insight into mitochondrial functions and ATP formation, ATP formation of uh, mitochondrial functions. Guys, we want to say that if you have any questions or suggestions regarding this session, you may write into us at our email address and for that note our email address, it is info.cec at nic.in. Thank you for watching this session and for being with us. And we once again thank you, Dr. Rawat.